So we came here and yeah, that was great. It really, I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. I loved it. It was just it's the freedom, I think, that is so good. Um, I mean, you'll remember the Harbour Cafe down at the bottom. Yeah. Well, we had that and, and above. And okay. above was a, um, a guest house and the cafe, of course, was down below. Well, I was born in Lyme and I'm a real Lyme girl. I'm 92 years old now. And um, when I, I was a hairdresser, I had my own business in, with, with a friend of mine and it was called Glenis and Joyce and we did that for quite a long time. When I first moved here, I came with my parents. My father was headhunted uh, by R.J. Stratton, who was an ironmonger. And um, we lived near the Woodroffe School for a while. It was the grammar school then, and then became the Woodroffe. And then my parents bought a house, which is called Limbank now, and it was called Horndean, which is by the bridge. Well, I first came here in 67 because my husband was posted here. He was in the RAF and he was posted to RAF Euston. So I came here uh, and we had a hiring up at Queen's Walk, which is nearby. I moved to Lyme with my parents in 1950. I was only two years old. He had just retired and he had had a job doing a lot of driving. So once we got down to Lyme, um, he immediately sold the car and spent the rest of his days here in the garden and prawning. And uh, so I grew up without a car, which was sort of interesting. So when I came here in the 60s, I could never get used to the, the lights, the street lights, because I was born in a village just outside of Lyme and called Kilmington in Devon. Yeah. And so I married here, a local bloke, and I never thought I'd adapt to Lyme. I thought I'd got to go home because I can't put up with these street lights. But then I did love Lyme. I fell in love with Lyme. So I've been here ever since. So quite been quite happy with with the town and with the people because they're so, so friendly. <laughs> a fairly idyllic childhood down here. The, the freedom was amazing. We were able to go out of the house in the morning and we used to play on the Ware Cliffs or down on the beach, round the cob. And we did all the sorts of things that kids of our age did. We caught crabs um, on the slipway. We used to catch them on one side of the slipway and then let them go on the other side of the slipway and they would run back across to be caught again. Um, I used to go prawning with my father. Um, with a, he had a hand net and we'd go on Monmouth or Charmouth side trying to find prawns and the occasional lobster in the rock pools. We had a small wooden boat um, and a little boat. We had, it was called Big Scud and Little Scud. Not quite sure why. And we used to go out in this boat and catch mackerel and do a few drop nets as well. My dad was a builder by trade and he built his own house, but he also ended up being having boats and was a fisherman. So he used to take day trips out, you know, and that when we were young. And he had, when, when I was really young and we used to go along the seafront, he had seven little rowing boats. One of them was called Glenis. And in the end, after years and years, as time went on, he had his own, he bought his own boat, which was a big building boat. And uh, he used to take trips, you know, take, take people out where the sailors were here during the war. Yeah, it was difficult to start with because uh, it was just before the war. And then during the war, uh, there was barbed wire on the on the beach and you couldn't go anywhere or do anything, you know, as kids. And uh, it was fun, but after the war, um, it was a lovely place to live. 
There's no two ways about it. And growing up, you know, uh, if you like, I was then going in about three or four years going into my teens and then in my teens was magic here. It really was lovely. The German prisoners of war built Anning Road from Church Street right the way through to the bottom of Colby Mead. They, they cut it all out. And all the earth that came from there went to, to uh, the Hornbridge and then Hornbridge is a field there, yeah. and it was all tipped there. They were out mill, middle mill, between, uh, between the second gate out, where used to be a tennis court there, there and the farm, there was a area there, that's where they were kept. They were always affable, and um, you know, as kids, they used to bake things for us. And give us as kids and so sort of like that, you know. It was difficult to know that they at one time were trying to kill my dad. This particular day, my mum said to me that I'm going to the Woodmead Halls to, to get a, a, an evacuee, you know, to see what was happening, you know, with the evacuee. So I said, oh, that'll be lovely. I said, but please get a little girl. When I got home, there were three boys and a little girl sat at the table. And of course, it was lovely, they were lovely, you know, and we were all brought up. My dad was a fireman during the war as well. And uh, always, when we went to bed at night, he'd piggyback us all up to bed and, t and take us to bed. We were never in, we were never in. I mean, I, I, I'd be out at seven o'clock in the morning, we'd be up, we'd gone, I don't know, to the ponies or, or we'd gone out in one of the boats or something, because we had a small boat. Um, my mother never knew where I was and we got back at eight o'clock at night and she just never knew, I mean now it's mobile phones, you know where all your kids are all the time, but um, no it wasn't like that then. <laughs> I just had a wonderful childhood, you couldn't have bettered it. We had a little boat we used to go out in, you have to be an outside person to live in Lyme. You just have to like outdoors because everything you do is outdoors. Just endless. Mm. It's wonderful. And everything that happened happened at the Woodmead Halls. You know, I don't I don't think that bingo was in vogue those days, but Saturday evening hops and all sorts of things. Stan and Francis, Peter and myself, the Bosenses. We were all friends together and we all used to have a good social life together. So that was my start in Lyme. And I would have been 17, 18 then. We needed to make friends more. And so I joined the Dramatic Society. And that was our main hobby together. I think really I loved Lyme Regis. That was a very quiet place at that time. This would have been 1959, you see, and really not a tourist resort at all. Lyme as a tourist place wasn't really so much in those days. Uh, tourists used to come often on the railway from Axminster, the Bluebell Line. The, the facilities were different then. There was quite a lot of small hotels. We had two in our drive, Sunny Dean and Glen Holm. There were probably 10 or 15 hotels and people came and were served an evening meal and it was quite prim and proper and all that sort of thing. There weren't people letting out their rooms to the same extent and of course there was nothing like an Airbnb in those days. There weren't the fish and chip emporiums. The one on Coombe Street did arrive sometime during my youth but that was the only one. There were lots of pubs, 15 maybe, a lot of them have closed down, mainly used by locals, and there was a few which were sort of touristy. The posh people used to stay at the Alexandra and the Bay Hotel. I've just remembered that it, we used to enjoy some of the fairly basic stuff. There used to be um, a searchlight tattoo along Middle Mill, um, organised by the British Legion or something like that, and they put a bridge there and they had the army and the, doing stunts, motorbikes and, uh, and, and things like that, I can remember that. And, and the regatta was big with Bumble Circus. We had um, Nob, Nobby Clark and Roy Gollop, uh, one dressed as the bear and the other the bear master, and he would throw a pole to the bear and all that sort of stuff, which used to terrify me when I was a child. Teen, te the teens in Lyme Regis in those days were wonderful. As any of my mates 
will tell you, um, there wasn't a lot of, what shall I say, entertainment in Limerick. There was a cinema. We used to use the cinema all the time, but we used to have to go to Axminster for dancing um, because the only place they had a dancing down here was the uh, RAF barracks. And um, they would only you know, maybe twice, three times a year sort of thing, you know. So we used to catch the bus uh, on the way to, a on that Saturday night for Axminster. And then invariably, if you had a girlfriend, you walked her home, she was in Axminster or something, and then you walked home from Lyme because the taxi wouldn't wait for you you know, for that long. So, to walk all the way back. so the number of times I've walked from Lyme, from Axminster to Lyme Regis is incredible. I go down to the river and then out to Middle Mill and then back to the London Inn and the children on the playing fields. The four disasters of Lyme. Disaster one. Disaster one was there was an article found in the New Scientist which said that a company called Nyrex that was given the job by the government to find places to, to dump nuclear waste in the country. And they had Lime Bay as one of their options that could be done. And I think up in Scotland there were two or three up there. But we were on the list of being a possible candidate for this nuclear waste. When we heard that, a whole load of us went, you know, um, went, went take, take action against what was going to take place. And um, the idea that Nyrex had, if it could get it, was between Lyme Regis and Charmouth, they were going to sink a shaft going down and then bore out under the bay to a big cavern they were going to make and there were going to be lifts going up and down this shaft and going out into the bay to put this nuclear waste. You know, it was amazing that they were thinking of that. So we called a town meeting that was going to be held in the Woodmead Halls. It was going to be like a debate and there was going to be those people in favour, which of course was the guy from Nyrex, and somebody else, which I can't remember, and then those against. And I think it was chaired by Pip Evans, but I'm not absolutely sure of that. And anyway, on, the, on our side was a guy called um, Sir Crispin Tickle. And he lived down um, further... Um, East and he was about 90 years old and we thought oh blimey you know well, what chance has he got against it so anyway the um, the meeting took place and just before it started I think it was the, uh, the mayor of Lyme came down through because it was packed the, the whole hall, you couldn't get in there. And uh, came down waving a piece of paper like Neville Chamberlain and saying that you can all go home because I've had a piece of paper here from the uh, Minister of the Environment, Tom King it was, uh, saying that in no way was there going to be nuclear waste dumped in the waters of Lime Bay. And we all said, but that's not what they want to do. They want to put the nuclear waste under the waters of Nine Bay. Uh, so the, the meeting actually went ahead. And the guy from Nyrex was unbelievable. And he said that he told us that they were going to build this shaft down and one thing or another. And he said, now maybe you're thinking, because this stuff's going to stay down there for thousands of years, if there was a catastrophe and there was no record of it being there, that if anybody ever bore down in the future, they would then find there was man-made 
substance coming up, meaning the concrete that was in it, and they would stop drilling. And we all went, what? That's not human nature. And human nature says, blimey, what's that? Keep going, let's find out, you know? So that didn't help. Um, then this, uh, he was a professor, I think, uh, Sir Crispin. He told us that he had been in favor of nuclear power. And as he got older, he realized that the nuclear waste was a big um, problem going into the future and he was now against it and he his suggestion was that there was a site opposite parliament a vacant site that they could build this nuclear put this nuclear waste they could grow ivy up the walls and it would be a constant reminder to the people in parliament of the, of the decision that they made well of course at the end of the meeting they said that all those in favor of this taking place and one of our councillors at the front put his hand up not knowing that nobody else you know and then said you know and all those against and of course the hands went up and and um so that was the the near disaster disaster one so well it's You, know, you get the usual thing from parents. What do you want to do when you leave school? And I said, I want to stay in line. So my dad said, OK, go down the main street, come back and tell me what there isn't. And so I said, well, there isn't a flower shop. He said, well, how do you feel about that? Yeah, that's good with me, because I, I obviously I liked nature. And, and from the age of 10, I had been growing things. So that was it. He said, first you take a business course. And that's when I used to catch the train from Lyme go to Exeter to St Luke's and, and there was a business course going there. I got a job um, at J.H. Shand in Axminster and I worked there, I was a costing clerk there and I used to commute and I used sometimes to go on the, the train, our train, sometimes on the bus but mainly on the train and that was another, that is another story because we all knew each other and the men on the railway, they knew that I caught the train in the morning to go to work. And when I, we lived at Horn Dean, I used to have to go up the Roman road up where the Victoria Hotel is, round to the railway station. And they say, we're waiting for you, come on. So I'd puff, puff, puff. They wouldn't go without me. But if the day came that I was not going to work, I had to ring them and say, I'm not coming to work today, don't wait for me. On one occasion, which was really very funny, I'd forgotten my sandwiches. And I said to the engine driver, I forgot my sandwiches. And my mum was at the bottom of the garden, the south field, which ran, the garden ran, or the railway ran alongside the, the uh, railway. And she, they slowed up, she threw my sandwiches, he caught them and gave them to me when we got to Coon Pine. <laughs> so then I went to work, cycled to work from Kilmington to Axminster to the carpet factory. So I worked there for a few years. You went to Axminster Carpet? Uh, Axminster Carpet. What did, what did you do? I did the winding of the bobbins, right? So I had to wind the bobbins so that the creelers could put them on the side for the carpet, for the looms and then they made the, made the carpet. Cycled every day, yes, and you had to go because the River Yarty would be flooded, would come over, but you still had to go to work. There was nothing, you couldn't go back and say to your mum, there was too much water. You had to wade through it. I went through it, yeah, up to my waist, and I still had to go to work. I still worked in the factory, still wet, and then went on back home again in the evening, eight o'clock till half past five. So I left home at half past seven in the morning cycling.
but when it snowed, I walked. I, I had to walk to work. You couldn't say I'm not going to work because it snowed. Six, five, four, three, two. Could you tell us who they are then? Yeah, Tim Stafford and Wally Schreier. The astronauts used to come and they used to sort of talk to us and all that, you know, and, and it was simply a case of coming and saying, look, make sure you get it right, you know. If you don't get it right, I'll be going to be stuck on the moon or something like this, you know. And this is sort of the way they, they handled it, you know. When we decided to come back home, we came back the day after we landed on the moon. That was the day we came back to England. But as I say, I maintain that I helped put a man on the moon. How, yeah, how did you feel about that? I, mean, I feel great. Yeah. And, and when I look around line readers, I think to myself, is anybody else having a day? <laughs> you know? Um, no, they didn't, you know, and, and quite frankly, the job I had, as I say, for Westerners and that, I traveled around, I mean, compared to, and I'm not knocking the line boys, don't get me wrong, I love them all, you know, but most of them stayed in line. I didn't, I went all around, and because of that, I feel good for it, you know. My husband was obviously working at Dunkers, RAF Dunkerswell, which is near Honiton, and I, didn't work because I had my baby but so most of my friends at that time were RAF wives who were in there were six quarters there and yeah so there was five other families there and All, what was it like living in Lyme at that time oh it was lovely we loved it and that's why we knew we would always come back we loved it so um, obviously, you know, we used to go down to the beach, do what every other families did with young children. And yes, I actually did join the drama club there because I've always loved it. So even though I had a young baby, I went to the drama club. <laughs> this was fun because we did, uh, Jenny Wiles did this spoof again of... Uh, she called it the Wizard of Cobb, and uh, and I t eventually turned out to be the wizard's assistant, and so <laughs> I came on with this wonderful headdress and everything, and a, a bent wand, and and this one was also from another production of Christmas Carol, Just clapping my hands to the music. They were having a dance and and I was just on side. This is a, a photograph of a character that I understudied in a sense that I was doing props for the production of The Heiress when uh, the director rang me up and said, would I take her part on because she was in hospital? And so I only had about six hours to learn the part had a quick rehearsal beforehand and we got on with it, it all went beautifully. And fortunately, this costume, it was her costume and it fitted me as well, so that was great. When Poppy was two, so that would have been in 1968, I saw the then vicar's wife with a big bunch of Michaelmas daisies in her arm opposite the church. And I said, Mrs. Charles, Mrs. Charles, um, I'm not able to do very much with guards, but I don't mind doing your books and looking after the badges. Come here, my dear. <laughs> and I was hooked. And from that day on, I have been involved in guiding. A year later, I was guider in charge. We were called captain in those days. So I was captain of, first one of Lyme Regis Guides and I ran it for 17 years. I was moved on, I became district commissioner. Um, I still involved in Lyme Guides. Then eventually I became division commissioner. So that meant that I looked after units in Bridport and Beminster and Charmouth and Lyme and anywhere else there was a, a unit, either brownies or guides. So I had a huge experience with them. 
The, the, the outfall pipe from the sewerage in Lyme Regis went straight out, raw sewerage went out to a, a buoy out in the bay there. And if the conditions were right, meaning that the tide was coming in and the wind was blowing in, then instead of going to Charmouth where we always wanted it to go, it didn't. It turned around and came back into Lyme. And Lyme for quite a while was known as Slime Regis. And you could walk down and you could paddle in your own excrement down at the bottom there. So something had to be done. So the, the Southwest Water came up with this plan that down at the bottom of the town where the Trumpton clock is at the moment, uh, they would build a maceration plant in there. It was like a small bungalow with a, with, a, with, a, with a stack that went up to take the smell. And every 10 days, there would be a lorry come and would take the, um, the stuff, because it's like a huge wheel that goes round and, and just makes it into like brown Windsor soup and, shank, and pushes it out so that you can't actually recognize it when you're in the water. Um, and then this lorry would have to come down for the screening stuff every 10 days and take it away. Unbelievable, our council were almost in favour of this option, partly because Southwest Water said that if they don't take this option, then it's going to be years before they'll ever come back and do anything. Again, the people of Lyme got together, a meeting was called, and we turned around and said, no way are we gonna have that. But what we didn't know when we called that meeting, that the European Union was gonna come up with legislation that would make that illegal for Southwest Water to do this. But if they got this plant in before that was passed, it would be sort of fate the company, oh well, you know, I mean, we just spent millions of pounds on this, so that will stay that way. Fortunately, they had then, because the town said, no, we're not having it, they had to go away and come back with a plan that we have today, whereby it is now pumped inland to a, to a, a treatment works, comes back down and the people in charge, they were so, so thrilled with what they'd done, these southwest water, they said you could actually drink the water that comes out the end. I didn't see any of them actually do it, but that's what they said. Ding dong, there you high, in heaven the bells are ringing. I'm a people person, I love people, you know, but we, we coped with it, we had to, didn't we? You know, really, I can't tell you very much, but you know. I... Was it very different being here with no, no people around? Oh yeah, yeah, it does make a difference, doesn't it really, you know? 
See, no. quite a lot of people said they quite enjoyed yeah. that. They quite enjoyed it. No, that. no. Don't keep me in. Don't keep me in. Yes, you could walk up the middle of the road without a car coming down. That's about all it did. <laughs> Everything else was very similar. It was like it, it was like late autumn, winter, and spring because that's how it is in Lyme. It's only it's only as as the children break up for the the spring holidays that it starts getting busy. All through the summer, by the time by the time August bank holiday comes and and you can't walk up the street quickly. And you can't get into a shop and you, without queuing and things like that. And you think, oh gosh, this is getting a little bit frustrating. But they all go home <laughs> because the school holidays are finished. So it really is not a problem. And it gives so many people employment. It was terrible because again, at my age, you know, and all of a sudden we were housebound. And that's the last thing I ever wanted to be was housebound. You know, it's as simple as that. Uh, it was no fun at all. And of course, at our age, you know, to, to get a doctor, you could have to wait two, three weeks. And, you know, I mean, my wife and I, she's been in hospital now, but um, we've been very lucky in that respect, health wise, you know. But as I say, um, some of the older people, it must have been terrible for them. In a way, I quite liked it <laughs> because I, I don't mind being on my own. And as long as I've got books to read, and television, and I can go out every day, and I did go out every day, sometimes twice. I walked to town, I wore my mask, I kept away, I walked, I went for walks along the river. I talked to my friends on the phone. I don't do Zoom or anything like that, so I didn't see them, but I talked to them and my family. I used to go along the front every Saturday, because I go, I, that's my, I do that. I used to go along there and it was quite nice that it was quite deserted. That was un a bit uncanny really, but I quite liked it. I mean, I, I know I like the visitors. Yeah. So, no, I, you know, I, I, <laughs> I can't say it was an endurance test really. <laughs> Fortunately, touch wood, um, I didn't get COVID, um, but so we were reasonably careful but I had lots of visitors coming. So honestly, I can't say I was badly affected. It's like a little family, really, isn't it, here? That's why we all love it, really. Here, you see in Lyme Regis, there are all sorts of um, organisations that you can join and, um, you know, enjoy yourself with them. Yeah. I look back at those periods, um, you know, quite happily. Um, it was quite a nice change to have Lyme quiet. Uh, and yeah, there was a peacefulness. I could look out from the garden and see nobody along the parade or along the beach, nobody at all. Often nobody around the cob. It was eerie we got used to it and we did enjoy the peace, you know. Um, I used. To, I have a habit of walking around the cob with um, with uh, two or three other guys, and we'd be doing it for a long time. And we used to walk apart, you know. We 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 refused to give up walking you know, together, but we kept apart. And, and when all the cafes were closed, we had to bring a flask or something and sit out on a seat. Or we we had a takeaway coffee, depending on what conditions allowed. But we still fought hard, you know, to have our morning routine. We had a more than average social time because my wife was involved with making scrubs for Bridport Hospital. She'd got to know a nurse and she's quite adept in that area and she and some friends started making hospital scrubs. She got a factory on Timber Hill, the, the only factory, I can't remember what it's called, to cut out the material. So I was running up and, to, and down with material and, and there was probably 20 people involved with picking up material, taking it away, making the scrubs, coming back. And we did everything outside here on the table so we weren't in too close a contact. And, um, and, 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 uh, and there were lovely stuff that my wife and her friends made. We were, I think, yeah, they were called the Cobb Team, yeah, as opposed to the Southwest Scrubbers, who were another, uh, another lot. When I think about it today, it was awful for lots and lots of people, but my neighbours, 
were very, very generous because young ones used to sit on the other side of the road and, hi Shirley, how are you? Fine. Lady down the road used to make delicious cakes, bring them up and put them in my porch, for, bring me up a yummy cake, put it in the porch. And we all used to greet each other. Having no tourists, as much as we need them, it was bliss. It was, I was going to say God given because we, we used to go along the seafront. Everybody at a distance would greet each other, have a chat at a distance. And it was lovely. It was lovely. You just felt free. And if you saw a strange face, you'd think, hmm, where did you come from? What are you doing here? Well, of course, the excuse was, oh, well, I've got, I've got a home here holiday home, that was always the excuse. It was quiet, but it was quite nice really to walk along the seafront and in the gardens and you hardly met a soul. But if you did, it was local people, so you could just have a far away talk to them, to say hello, whatever. How were they keeping this, that and the other? Yes, I don't think anybody went without anything because you all had your neighbours Leave alone they came with the masks on if did you want anything or were you all right to get out and so yeah, just found it. Everybody here is lovely people. I'm at the top of Broad Street, it's a lovely Dorset day. I'll have a beer at the volunteer and then be on my way. Lime Regis suffers from the fact that there is slippage not coming from the sea, but coming from the land, slipping down. But also, the sea does play a factor in it. If anybody remembers, when you used to walk along the sea front, the beach was like outside of the amusement arcade and around there. You would not think of jumping off that down onto the beach. There was at least a 12 foot or 13 foot drop onto the beach. So the waves used to come in and hit that wall and go right up and there are many photographs of it going as high as the Bay Hotel and shook everything when it did this. Well with this instability of the land behind and the waves hitting the front something had to be done. So they came up with this idea that they would put rock armour like islands just off the, the, the beach. I think there were there were at least two or maybe three of them uh, going from the cob towards cob gate with a gap between. So what it would mean is if you sat on the beach you wouldn't be able to see the horizon, you wouldn't be able to see um, the, uh, uh, the coast because of this rock armour. Plus the fact when the tide went out children could go out and they could be on this rock armour and on the far side of it, and you would have no idea about them. Tide comes in, you know, it, 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 it was a cheap, cheap option to do. Waves hitting the wall, stop the waves, put something in front of it. That was their plan. Again, Ryan Reed just got together once more, and know that they have the power, they said, no, we're not having that. We're not having it. So, they had to go away, West Dorset had to go away and um, come up with another plan to stop the sea hitting the wall. As you see today, they spent millions on uh, putting shingle so that it dissipates the waves as they come in and it doesn't hit the wall as it, as it used to and that incorporated into the sewerage that I was talking about earlier, so it all went in together. So, um, and um, when they, again, when they eventually uh, completed that, again, West Dorset patted themselves on the back and said, haven't we done a wonderful job? But if we'd have had what they wanted, we'd have had, and I think down in Sid Sidmouth or Seton, they've got these, these rock armour out. Uh, so, Really, um, we, uh, we stopped that once again. OK, if you look at old pictures of Lyme, you'll see there was a mass of trees um, next door to us where part of the Langmore Gardens are now. These trees belonged to a relative of the Cadbury family who had quite a big mansion up near where the Obstacle Gulf is now. 
he, uh, he sold the land to a developer and the developer got planning permission from West Dorset Council and our council uh, to build a whole lot of chalets down below where Swim is now and garages which you could access from the top where Mark Hicks is. He, he took tons and tons of soil down to the beach where it was taken away by lorry or, 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 or the sea. It seems strange but that did happen. Um, and we were worried about these big bulldozers right near our house. We could feel the ground shaking. I was 14 at the time when it was happening and we were worried, you know, but we assumed that everything was all right. And then one day in February 1962, everything started to creak and shake. Um, I was trying to do my homework with, with Pete Fortnum uh, at our place and it was starting to get a bit frightening because the, you, we could tell that there was some sort of movement going on. And over a period of time, um, the doors jammed uh, windows started breaking, the ceiling, bits of ceiling started falling in, the floor started coming up and after a certain number of hours of it getting worse and worse the police came and told us we had to evacuate the house and we moved two doors away for the night and when we came back we found that although our house hadn't moved it had twisted over on one side and was unlivable in from that moment onwards. I can remember the next day I going to school without my school uniform because we couldn't find it. The RAF men came along and helped to take all our furniture out and put it up the drive, the bits that could be rescued. You know, the piano was damaged, the little billiard table we had was damaged and things like that. And people were very helpful, you know. A local builder I can remember who'd just done some work for us uh, came to my father with a tin and says I think this is yours Cyril and it was full of money. Dad was obviously hoarding stuff away at the time <laughs> and I thought that was interesting and, and so after that from 14 onwards our life changed you know we led a nomadic existence living in other people's houses and then we we had chalets and a caravan in the top of the garden and we were finally allowed what looked like a double caravan, two bits joined together down the middle, very, very primitive, on wheels, theoretically so that the, the house could be wheeled back if there was more movement. Anyway, um, it, it never was. And so my parents adapted from a big three-storey colonial house, which you'll see in the old pictures, um, to a very, very basic big caravan. And they weren't young then, and uh, they survived to tell the tale. They lived for a lot of years afterwards. My brother and I, being 14 and 16, carried on, you know, and, uh, and shook it all off as a bit of an experience, you know. Well, I think it was an elm tree anyway. But it had been there all of our lives, you know. And um, it was exactly, as I say, a shady tree. And it was a place where we could go, sit on the grass, under the shady tree, when the sun was hot, you know. and. That, it was just a place where we where we met. If you recall, you go down that slope, right? Yeah. You come along any road on that side. If you're going towards Coenme, you're on the left hand side. The last house there, from that slope to there, is where Shady Tree was, right there. Well, yes, because it was the Bluebell Line and the spring was amazing. It was glorious. It was literally solid bluebells all the way through the cuttings. The train would always give a peep as it was going to go across the viaduct. And everybody was standing at the sides looking out. It was lovely. Going out on a mackerel trip was one of the main leisure activities for visitors. Um, some coaches used to arrive at the square and there would be Lionel Hodder and Lewis Hodder with their boats down on the groin there by the by the clock and they would take people out from there. Uh, if the tide was low they would get in a rowing boat and they would row out to the boats a bit further out. Down at the cob there was the surried ranks of boatmen shouting next trip 10 minutes skylark or etc etc. They were all touting for business and competing with each other for business and they didn't all get on with each other. There was customer stealing. Somebody would be sent round the cob and then directed into another boat, for instance. Occasionally this broke out into almost, well, I'm afraid to say a few fisticuffs occasionally. So the boatmen were people to respect and keep, a, keep your distance from a bit because they were determined to make a living and they were totally ruthless in terms of attracting customers. 
but it was a main feature of Lyme Regis at the time. If you're blue and you don't know places that spring to mind, although I love all of Lyme. One is when you're coming back from Charmouth and you're coming into Lyme at the top of the hill and you look over and you see the sea and the sun shining and the trees, it's so lovely. And you can see Lyme and the, the harbour spread out, it's so lovely. And the other one is I walk along the front a lot. And I do love that, looking towards Charmouth and stone barrow, uh, you know, it's, it's so, you think, why do I need to go away? Cart Langmore Gardens, watching this world go by and there's boats, no boats now, Langmore Gardens. They can leave me there if they want to. <laughs> Bobby Field, Middle Mill was one. You know, it was, it was lovely to go out there. We used to go out there all the time. And the other one is the beach. And it was the back beach, not the front beach. That was where all the visitors went. The locals went here to the black beach. I love Lyme completely, but I love to go into the Langmore Gardens and stand and look out to sea. In the gardens, in the far end near the restaurant, you'll see there's a monkey puzzle tree. Have you seen it? Now that monkey puzzle tree was given to Pete by my daughter, my youngest daughter. It was her present to him at the beginning of 2014. And when she brought it in in a pot, I was absolutely aghast. I said, where on earth are we going to put that thing? It can't go in the front and it can't go in the front and it can't go in the back. Pete said, don't worry, I'll find somewhere. The gardeners will find somewhere for it. Well, first of all, he thought that maybe up in the cemetery, but they didn't want to make a woodland of the cemetery, which is fair enough. You know, you plant one, you want somebody else wants it. They said, leave it to us. We'll find a spot. Well, a couple of months rolled on and there was a knock on the door. And lo and behold, they said, we found a place in the gardens for your tree. And we're going to plant it there for you. Well, apart from the cob and the sea, I would talk about the Ware Cliffs. We used, that used to be our playground. There was a reservoir not um, right up there, not far from the track, with a lot of water in it, and we used to play around that. We used to walk along to Pin Hay. We used to go down to the beach. We used to try and get hold of seagulls' eggs rather dangerously from the cliffs. Um, and sometimes we'd go to the All Hallows Beach. All Hallows was a private was a public school with its own beach and we used to go down to the beach there and they sometimes used to keep a rubber boat there which we used to try and um, borrow. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so I would say, if not the cob, I would say the Ware Cliff. Oh my goodness, well, I suppose on the beach, along the seafront, up in the gardens, in the pubs. <laughs> What's your favourite? I didn't know what to say that. <laughs> That's alright. What's your favourite pub? I do like the Volunteer and I do like the Nag's Head. It is a Marine Theatre, eh? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, Why? <laughs> Why? Why? Well, 
I don't know, it's always been welcoming and um, and there are uh, now lots of things going on and it is commercially um, able. Take the road called Silver Street up to the railroad yard The puff and the billy is no more, life sure is getting hard Okay, now we come to Near Disaster 4. The lifeboat station and the harbour master's office and the uh, coast guard. There used to be just a small uh, lifeboat station down at the bottom of Cobb Hill. It was like a garage thing. Uh, not really fit for purpose. So it was decided that we needed a new uh, centre for them for these uh, agencies. So West Dorset District Council, in their infinite wisdom, put out a, uh, a competition for architects to come up with a plan to house the, uh, the, the lifeboat, the Coast Guard, and the Harbour Master. The winning entry was then being shown down at the Marine Theatre. They gave £25,000 as the prize for the winning entry. Well, this architect came down and he gave a presentation of his plan for, the, for this building. The idea was that on the sandbar, in the middle of the sandbar, they were going to build this, this, this huge building which was a cross between the conning tower of Heathrow and a nuclear bunker. Uh, he gave this demonstration on everything of how it was going to uh, house all these three uh, different agencies. And then when he had finished, he asked for questions. There was a short silence and then one of the gollops, I think it was one of the gollops, got up and he said, ah, he said, well, it's a lovely plan you've got there, he said. He said, and um, I see that you've got um, a place for the RLNI um, on the bottom of this uh, building, he said, and a um, slipway going into the middle of the harbour and, and a place outside to wash the boat down. And that, very, very nice, very nice, he said. He said, then you've got a kitchen for them and a toilet for them. Because, well, when they come in, they're going to want to make a cup of tea. They're going to want to use the toilet. So you've got those facilities for them. Very nice, very nice. He said, then you've got the Coast Guard. He said, now the Coast Guard, he said, when they come down, he said, well, nice facilities for them. He said, and I see you've got the, because you told us, the windows in the place are high up, so if they bring bodies in or anything, people can't gawk through the windows at any, any, uh, anybody in there. Very good, he said. And then, of course, they're going to want to make a cup of tea, and they're going to want a toilet, so you've got a kitchen for them. And that. Yeah, very nice. He said, then you've got the harbour master. He said, he's got this tower thing on the front that looks over the whole of the harbour. He said, but I don't know that you can see over the harbour wall with it. But anyway, he said, now he is going to want to make a cup of tea and something, he said, and, and he's going to want a toilet, which you've provided for. Very nice, very nice. He said, and he said, well, bugger me. He said, there's only about 12 of them down there. Why the hell can't they share a kitchen and the toilets, you know? He said, well, the place erupted into laughter at it, you know? And other people got up and said, you know, you're going to uh, take half of the uh, sand beach away. And we all know that when the lifeboat is called out, we used to have this thing that they, in the old days, when they used to have the rockets go up, that the lifeboat could possibly kill three coming down Cobb Hill at the speed to save one out at sea. 
So they come flying down and now they've got to go along in front of the fish and chip places to get to the, the, the building that's um, right by the north wall. I mean, you know, it's right in the middle, towards the middle of the harbour on the sandbar. Well, that was the fourth one that came about and the line people said we're not having that. So again, West Dorset went away again and they came up with the plan that we have today whereby the lifeboat station is, is tucked back into the Monmouth beach and they come out across the pathway going out and launch from there, which was far, far better and anybody with any sense could have told them that in the very first place. So that was the fourth near disaster of Lyme. Well, I think you, you just have to make the best of it because it's such a beautiful place. Wherever you look, it's so lovely. And there's lots of clubs going on now that, that you can join. And though I do think that once you're 18 or 17, as it is now, it's best to learn to drive because to get work, sometimes you have to travel. I and mean, that study in college and university. Yes, to, yes, although they run a bus to the colleges. Yeah, they do do that. I, I don't know. I, oh my, I've got a young grandson of 19 and... He would, whenever he comes here, he just doesn't want to go away again, you know. I just think they've got to make the most of living in such a beautiful place and join in. I would say, you know, young people, when they are here, uh, they, they can have a great life. And if they involve themselves with stuff particularly related to the sea, you know, sea scouts, sailing, rowing, fishing, swimming, all the things that you know, are beneficial for you and you may, and they may not get when they're in later life because they may not be able to be living by the sea. So enjoy it while you can and appreciate it. If you make the best of your education, I know you must hear all this from family, but education, education will help you in your future life. You may or may not be able to get a job here in Lyme, but one day you'll feel that you can come back as have so many other people. There isn't anywhere like Lyme to live. And when you experience other situations, other places, you'll realise what a wonderful place Lyme Regis is. And there is, although Lyme, I'm sad to say, does not offer young people very much in the way of a social life, just Take care of your friends and make good friends and good decisions. Don't be led astray if you can help it. Um, set an example and uh, I suppose you know, saying, yes, here comes another old lady giving us advice, but I really mean this. You know, look after yourselves, take care of yourselves. You have one life and one opportunity. And if an opportunity presents itself, a good opportunity, then take it. And maybe you could set up something for young people. Maybe it's in your hands and not left to all us oldies to provide for you. Try and do something for yourselves. Well, I think you'd say try and stay, but it all depends if there's any houses. I mean, if there's no houses, some of them got to go out of the town, which is very unfortunate, but the houses aren't here, not for people. So they just got to go where it's cheaper. If they have any idea of what they want to do, um, for instance, are they clever enough to go to university? So therefore, they need to work pretty hard on their school um, curriculum. But also it's very valuable that they should know a bit about money so that um, they could have a part-time job or um, um, there are plenty of part-time jobs during the season in line. So I would recommend them to do any sort of work that they can. And it may be some 
some of them could go on to farms and, uh, you know, I think now there is a, a much more interest in young people being in farming and so, you know, that's really what I would recommend, mm -hmm. to have a job that is really suitable for you personally. <laughs> Daily Sunrise Boats in harbour, sunrise here Magic of the morning, so clear Mass so dark and stillness calm Swimmers swim and come to no harm Heads bobbing like seals in joy Swim out to yellow boy Charmeth distance so much fun Free for all, everyone The mornings I must say are the best they're full of life as water hits the chest and soul fills with delight and happiness early mornings full of zest out we get and homeward bound no but seagulls make a sound drying down a warm drink we had only happy thoughts and nothing sad so when you go down to the sea today to swim to make sand castles or just play Sunrise is the best for all to see, so come and bring the family. <laughs> Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease has all too short a date. Sometimes too hot. The eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometime declines, by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest, nor shall death brag. Thou wanderest in his shade, When eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, So long lives this, and this gives life to thee. OK, this is a poem written by my daughter Emily May, who is a fine writer and, and poet, and it's called Flotsam and Jetsam, and I'll read you out some of that. They say you never see the same sea twice, but I've skimmed the same round pebble many times. It boomerangs back with each tide. To the east of the cob there's an ocean turned to stone. The fossil floor survived the railway, tarnished with barnacles, other anchored mollusks. The boats come in, kraken and Spanish eyes, mackerel on a string, sparkling sheen, the proud full feeling despite saline cuts and hints of iron red. The skies are forecast by barometer and whether you can still see the cliffs or are they lost to mist? On clear days there is no end. We keep watch from our hill, hide in the blackberry thicket, wearing fuchsia's ballerina skirts, a foxglove on each finger. One last tree, circled in concrete, is a relic to my grandfather. Magnolia petals mourn the slow-growing yucca and sun-catcher pampas grass. He was a gardener, provider, nourished the soil with all he had left. Horace the thrush took currants from his hand, soprano to his trowel base. We are all descendants.
yeah. Midsummer Memories. Okay. I sat in Coe Mead. I was sat on the doorstep, North Avenue, when I wrote this one. Out of the gloom spread the last remaining swallow, tired of chasing summer gnats in flight. A faint breeze gently ruffled, sentinel flowers bending before the night. In the distance, a single sound was heard of a motor on a lonely road, and out of the stillness came a baby's cry, signaling its mother to behold. On the warm air came an odor of damp earth and sleeping flowers. In the deafening, deepening dusk, a cat stalked, ready to assert its feline powers. Tiny lights coming from the windows of the homes both near and far challenged the twinkling brightness of a solitary shining star. In the time that I had sat there, the sky had turned from velvet blue to a golden, then an orange, and was now a deep red hue. The tranquility of that summer evening, while sitting, pondering in the night, reassured me that tomorrow could be faced and would be all right. Now the preachers, they'll be beside me And the warden is very near I guess my journey's over now I see we're finally here But you see, you didn't stop me Not even though you tried I made my walk through life In my mind, oh yes I Yeah.